Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to meet together as a group of physicians and residents and interns and medical students and dental, dentists and dental students, spouses and friends. We thank you for the great privilege and opportunity of walking in the footsteps of the great physician. Teach us, dear Lord, to minister like he did to the patients that come in contact with us and to the people who we touch for your kingdom. In Christ's name, amen. In the late 1950s, the American Medical Association was faced with a very, very unique problem. They were confronted with a large challenge. Their difficulty related to the controversy that swirled around the subject of medicine and religion. Now, there was one thing for certain. The AMA didn't want to give the impression that they were promoting the cause of religion. They did not want to cozy up to those Bible thumpers. But here was the problem. How could the AMA in the late 1950s deal with the growing body of evidence that medicine and religion were intimately linked and a proper understanding of religion was healthful? In 1961, the AMA took a quantum leap. For the first time, they established a department of medicine and religion. And that department grew in a few years to 48 states and 622 county and medicine, uh, county and county medicine and religion committees. Now, the director, Dr. Bernard Daniels, based in Denver, Colorado, made a remarkable statement. Now, the interesting thing about these 622 committees on religion and health established by AMA, the interesting thing about it is that they had clergymen and physicians on them. The AMA fostered an integrated unity in the early 1960s between clergymen and religion and, and, uh, and doctors. Here's what they said. They said, we feel that there needs to be a closer cooperation between the physician and the clergyman for the care of the whole person. The committee feels that the spiritual component of every person is a very large factor in the problems relating to his state of health. Now, the truth is that 45 years later, that statement is more true today than it was 45 years ago. There's a growing body of evidence in the scientific community, in the relationship between health and spirituality. There have been over 300 studies done on health and religion. Spirituality today is an enormous feature in the area of health and health promotion and health focus. For example, 1995, the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center found that a major predictor for, the re for survival, for heart surgery, had to deal with religious faith. The deeper a person's religious faith, according to the Dartmouth-Hitchcock studies, the more likely it was that they would survive heart surgery. The less their religious faith, the less potential that they would survive heart surgery. The National Institute on Aging study found that geriatric patients were physically more healthy and much less depressed if they had a positive spiritual experience. University of Minnesota, within the last few years, has established a center for health and spirituality. There's a PhD by the name of Dr. Mary Jo Kreitzer who directs that. And she writes, spirituality and health are indissolubly linked. Now, she refers to Florence Nightingale and something that I certainly wasn't aware of until my recent studies, and you may not be either. You know, when we think about Florence Nightingale, we think about hospital management and how Florence Nightingale restructured hospital management. We think about nursing, of course, and her great contribution to nursing. But Florence Nightingale's largest treaty was on spirituality and health. And she saw an indissoluble link between the spirituality of the patient, and the health of the patient. More and more major universities in America today 
have courses on spirituality and healing. The Seventh-day Adventists no longer stand alone. We are no longer a pioneer voice in the field. In fact, in some instances, we may lag behind the general population and the general body of evidence that's occurring. Seventh-day Adventists at times who are timid to discuss spirituality find themselves uh, quite uh, running and panting out of breath at times to catch up to a larger body of medical evidence. For example, Dr. Howard S. Heyman of the University of Illinois adds his voice to the growing number of voices in this chorus of voices speaking about the importance of spirituality and health. And Dr. Heyman says, University of Illinois, a healthy human life is more than a struggle for survival. It's essentially a search for human fulfillment and meaning related to ultimate concerns and commitments. Despite Western man's religious doubts and, his, and the rise of skepticism, he has a growing hunger for a more spiritual outlook on life. That's why, he says, at the University of Illinois, we've introduced our course on spirituality and healing. Because there is this gnawing hunger within. Now, the goal of the Christian physician is to lead his patient from illness to wellness, to enable that patient to pass from sickness to health, to enable them to pass from life to death. This evening, I want to share with you, as a physician and as a dentist, how to take a spiritual inventory. You've been taught how to take a, spirit, how to take a, a physical history, but we want to talk about spiritual inventory. And I've developed a quartet of spiritual modalities for physicians that will enable you to take a spiritual diagnostic inventory so that your patient can pass from illness to wellness. The true work of the Christian physician is to be a conduit so that through rational scientific law, through the eight natural remedies, through the genius of modern science, and through spiritual principles, the, the physician's office becomes a passageway. So I want you to think of yourself as one who guides the patient on a journey, on a passage, if you please, from illness to wellness. Now, to help us understand this passageway, I use the word PASS as an acronym, P-A-S-S. -S. And we want to talk about the healing effects of a quartet of spiritual modalities and how this quartet can be introduced to the patient in your office, in the setting of the office. First, we'll talk about the healing effects of prayer. And we'll talk about prayer as a therapy. Then we'll talk about the healing effects of a positive mental outlook and how to deal with that with the patient attitude. Then we'll talk about the healing effects of scripture. Then the healing effects of service. So P-A-S-S, -S, passing from illness to wellness. Prayer, attitude, scriptures, and service for physicians in the context of their office. We begin by looking at the healing effects of prayer. Prayer is a vital therapy in the healing of disease. I'd like you to take your Bible and go back to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. We may not be able to explain all the rationale for intercessory prayer. But one thing is for certain, intercessory prayer is biblical. Throughout scripture, you find the apostles on their knees praying. Paul is in a dark, damp dungeon in Rome, and we find him praying for the church at Philippi. Do you actually believe, Paul, that you can get on your knees and something significant is going to happen that wouldn't happen if you weren't praying? Paul Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. He's in Rome. He's praying for the church at Philippi. I thank my God upon every request, every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you with all joy. Verse 12 and onward. 
Let's go down, though, and look at verse uh, verse 8. For God is my witness, how I greatly long for you with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in the knowledge and all discernment. Paul says, I'm on my knees praying for you. Verse 12, I know that the things that have happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Verse 19, for I know this will turn out for my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, there are two things fascinating about this passage. First, in Philippians 1, verse 3, Paul says, In Rome, I'm on my knees praying for you. I believe my prayers are going to ascend to heaven and that God will do something for you in Philippi that he wouldn't do if I didn't pray. Then Paul says, I know that this, verse 19, imprisonment will turn out for my salvation because not only am I praying for you, but you are praying for me. Now, when I first read that passage, I was baffled by it. Why does Paul say, I know that this imprisonment, this trial that I'm going through, this difficulty that I'm going through, this pain that I'm going through, this suffering that I'm going through, the old apostle now was an aged man. He was ready to die. And with quivering hand and trembling pen, with dimmed vision, with pain racking his body, he wrote to Timothy from that same dungeon, the time of my departure, my death is at hand, and I'm ready to be offered up like an offering to God. Here, the old man is dying. Why does he say, I know that this imprisonment will turn out for my salvation? Is he so insecure in his relationship with Jesus Christ that he has to pray at the end of his life, well, I hope this prison, imprisonment, I know it's going to turn out for my salvation. Did he not have the assurance of salvation? Did he not know that Christ was living in his heart? Couldn't he say, I know in whom I believed? Why does he write, as an old man ready to die, I know that this is going to turn out for my salvation, as if he has no assurance? As I began to study that passage, I discovered that the word for salvation in the Greek language is a totally different word. He's not talking about his eternal salvation in Christ. The word there is soteria. There's another translation of that word, a far better translation. It has to do with health and healing, and the word is therapy. And the text could easily read, For I know that my imprisonment will turn out to be therapy for me, because you're praying for me, and the Spirit will be supplied to me through your prayer, so that even the darts that the devil has hurled at me will be my therapy. Intercessory prayer releases us from the bondage of sin and enables everything the devil throws at us to be therapy. So intercessory prayer is a form of therapy that enables us to be healed in the trials of life. And this is Paul's point, that because you are praying for me, I go through therapy in my time of trial. There is a growing body of evidence that intercessory prayer is a modality that God uses to bring therapy to patients. There's a great deal in the Bible about the need to pray. There are just a very few select verses that talk to us about what happens when we pray. Now, there's nobody in the world that fully understands the significance of intercessory prayer. It is a divine science. It's one of those sciences that's infinite. But if something is infinite, it doesn't mean you don't know anything about it. It means that you can never know everything about it. That which is infinite does not mean you do not explore it. It means that no matter how much you explore it, you'll never exhaust it. Because you don't know something about everything doesn't mean you can't have the benefit of the everything you don't know about the something that you're studying. Now, let me give you an example. When were vitamins discovered? I got some medical students from Loma Linda here. When were, when were vitamins discovered? Around. What about B complex? When were the, when were the key studies done on vitamin B complex? You remember? Who did the studies on B complex? Wasn't that Ray Williams, Mayo Clinic? I'm a theologian. I know that one. <laughs> 1948, 49? In that area? 
that, that Ray Williams did his studies on B-complex now. Did the medical community know anything about vitamin B complex in 1810, 1820, 1830, 1840? Did they? Now let me ask you a question. Who gets more vitamin B out of whole wheat bread? The farmer who eats whole wheat bread made by his wife in 1840, or Dr. Arnott who eats his dear wife's whole wheat bread in 2005? Who gets more vitamin B? Now, doctor or not, I've heard him lecture, one of the finest medical lecturers in the Adventist church today, and I do not say that half-heartedly. Doctor could lecture on vitamin B for the next 10 hours. I know about 30 seconds worth on vitamin B. This man could lecture on vitamin B complex for the next 10 hours. But my question stands, who gets more vitamin B? Doctor or not, who lectures on it for 10 hours, or the guy who eats it in 1830 who knows nothing about it? but that guy doesn't know anything about it. And he still gets as much vitamin B as Dr. not. How can that be true? This man knows. Because you don't know half, have to know everything about something to get the benefit of it. All you have to do is masticate the whole wheat bread in your mouth and swallow it. And it doesn't make any difference whether you're a physician or a peasant. It doesn't make any difference whether you graduated with a Ph.D. in vitamin B from Loma Linda, or not. All you need to do is eat it. And it is the same thing with intercessory prayer. Don't try to figure it out in your head. Just do it. Just do it. There is a growing body of evidence that indicates that intercessory prayer makes a major difference. Now, it was difficult for many secular Physicians, seeing this body of evidence come in. Do you know that there are many atheistic physicians in America today who will tell their patients to pray, although these physicians do not believe in God? And here's their idea. They'll say, look, we think you ought to pray. Uh, they may not say it that way, but they'll ask their patient in a sophisticated way, where do you find strength for your difficulties? And if the patient seems to indicate toward religion, they'll say, we suggest maybe that you pray. Now, this physician will be an atheist. Now, if you ask him, why as an atheist do you tell that person to pray? They'll say, well, it's very simple. I don't believe there's God, but prayer is kind of a, kind of a form of wishful thinking, and it's a, you can release positive chemical endorphins if you do it, so whether there is a God or not, it's healthful to do it because you can... Uh, release these positive chemical endorphins in the mind and they will course through your body and promote healing and they'll increase the antibodies and help your immune system. And so because uh, intercessory prayer, because the person believes that it's, it's helpful for them, that's what they would argue. There are some studies, though, in intercessory prayer, and I recognize that any study you do could be challenged. I am not naive on that point. But there are some studies to me that are quite fascinating. San Francisco General Hospital, coronary care unit, Randolph Byrd, 1992 to 1993. Byrd took 393 patients, did a double-blind study. It's kind of hard to have uh, positive chemical endorphins released from your brain if you don't know you're being prayed for. Now, you remember I have already told you that I don't understand everything about intercessory prayer, but I'm not, humble, I'm not embarrassed about that because nobody else does either. But in Bird's study, it was a double-blind study, and the conclusion in the Southern Medical Journal was that the patients that were prayed for had less congestive heart failure, they had less antibiotic therapy, they had less episodes of pneumonia, and they had less cardiac arrest after their heart surgery. Classic pioneer study. Mid-America Heart Institute, Kansas City, Missouri, um, improved health and rapid healing, more rapid healing among those patients that were prayed for. And uh, in that study on prayer, they gave what was called a p-value of 0.04. Now, a p-value of 0.04 means this, that, there are only tw it, that the odds of the study, the odds of the study's results coming out like they did, the ratio is 25 to 1. That's what a p-value of 0.04 is, 25 to 1. What happened was that it was 25 to 1 that the people that were prayed for would have the dramatically improved health that they did and the rapid healing that they did. 
probably one of the more fascinating studies that I've read in intercessory prayer was a study done by Dr. L. Levicki, 2001. He took 3,393 patients. They all had bloodstream infections. Treated the, they were treated for in general hospitals across America for a five-year period, 1991 to 1996. In every instance where the studies were, were done, there was some, these three studies, in every instance of these three studies, there was some beneficial result for intercessory prayer. Statistically, about 75% of the studies, the 300 studies done in intercessory prayer, about 75%, 75 to 78% of it indicates some positive uh, value, about 25% uh, don't. But in this instance, the Vicky studies indicated there was shorter hospital stay and shorter duration of fever. Ellen White writes, Ministry of Healing, page 509, prayer and faith will accomplish what no power on earth will accomplish. I would like to suggest to you tonight that prayer is a spiritual therapy. Now, Time Magazine with CNN in June of 1996 and USA Weekend Magazine, February 1996, did a study on spirituality, prayer, and faith in America. Now, this is fascinating to me. Seventy percent of those surveyed, and these were two separate surveys, and they both came out to around 70 percent by CNN and Time and USA Today in, in, in its weekend edition. Seventy percent believed that spiritual faith and prayer can aid to recovery from illness. Seventy percent of your patients believe that spiritual faith and prayer is an aid to illness. Then these same people surveyed were asked, how would you feel if your physician offered to pray for you? 64% believe health patients should open, health professionals should openly talk to their patients ab about their spiritual life and to pray with them. So when people walk through your office, According to Time Magazine, according to CNN, according to, to the uh, USA Today, 64% of them believe that you ought to be praying with them. I wonder at times if I fail them. I wonder if times in their heart they're crying out to me. If this statistic is true, there is a latent longing in the heart for spiritual care. And in a society that shifts towards secularism, agnosticism, and atheism, and in a society that is becoming less churched, there is a heart longing for spirituality. So the physician's office becomes the pulpit of a secular age where many won't go to church. The, 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 the physician in a secular society becomes the purveyor of divine grace. In the spiritual inventory, how can you practically lead into that as a physician? Pass a quartet of spiritual modalities. How can physicians and dentists take a spiritual inventory? Now, you might find these questions helpful. There are four. Four practical questions that can be used by the spirit to open the mind. There's a principle that we have followed through the years that we call the green light principle. Now, the green light principle says this, as long as the light is green, you keep going. When it's red, you stop. When it's yellow, what do you do? If you're an Adventist physician, you put your foot on the gas because you're late for your appointment, you go through. If the light's green, you go. If the light's yellow, you proceed with caution. If the light's red, you stop. So these questions are going to enable you to know whether or not the light's green. You proceed a little bit further if it's yellow, and you stop if it's red. As you're sitting talking to your patient, 
about the symptoms that they have, casually you smile and say something like this to them. John, Mary, it's a tough time in your life. I I sense that. I know the diagnosis today wasn't pretty. And we talked about that lump. And we're going to do everything we can in medical science to see that that's cared for. And I want to assure you that as your primary care physician, I will use every method I know scientifically to get you better. I want you to know that we will pull out every stop and that I have great confidence that, the, that this thing is going to be cared for. I have great confidence. I don't want you to be overly concerned about this. But I was wondering, throughout your life, when you face challenges or difficulties, is there a place where you personally find a source of strength. Now, there are two ways to ask questions. You can ask questions that are threatening or non-threatening. A threatening question only has one answer. It leaves a person boxed in. They have no alternative. Don't you think that you ought to turn to God in a time of crisis? I don't think I ought to turn to God. Give me a break, Doc. You see, your very posture can turn a person off. An overly aggressive posture. A threatening question. Don't you think you ought to? But a simple question. You've talked about science and what science is going to do for that person. And then you simply say, John, Mary, is there a place that you find a source of strength in your own life? And the person may say, you know, In times of my crisis in my life, I I turn to God. Another, at that point, you can then say to the person, do you find strength as you turn to God? And it leads into a spiritual discussion. There's another question that I will often ask a person. As I'm sitting there with them, I might say something like this. Are you feeling an unusual amount of stress in your life at the present time. You've just diagnosed a person. The illness is not malignant. They've come to you for nervous anxiety. They have heart palpitations. Maybe the symptom is, uh, is uh, uh, over acidity in the stump. Maybe the, the symptom is a stomach ulcer. Maybe here's a woman who's a secretary who has uh, rashes on both arms. And you ask her, are you feeling unusual amount of stress in your life right now? She responds, is there something specific that's troubling you? Can you think about that which is specific that's troubling you? Would you like to share it with me? I'm sorry for the emotional pain that you're going through right now. And you know, when I have emotional pain in my own life and when I'm faced with something that's overwhelming, I tend to turn to God in prayer. Would you have a comfort level if we prayed together? Do you see where the question is going? It's gentle. It's not forceful. It's providing an opportunity for that person to open up to God. Prayer is a therapy that provides powerful healing. It's a therapy that releases spiritual antidotes within the body that opens up the person to the Spirit of God. One of the texts in Scripture that really indicates what happens when we pray that I introduced a little earlier is 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. Why is it that God will do in answer to the prayer of faith that which he would not do if we did not thus pray? Why Does God do something when we pray? Although I don't understand everything about intercessory prayer, I understand this. That there is a controversy between good and evil in the universe. That God respects our freedom of choice. That God's doing everything he can for your patient to bring them to healing and wellness whether you pray or not. Before you ever pray, God is at work because God is a God that longs to bring health. God is doing everything he can to win your son, your daughter for Christ that doesn't know him whether you pray or not. God's doing everything he can to win your husband, your wife to Christ, uh, your aunt, your uncle, your father, your mother. God is doing everything he can to win your neighbor to Christ, whether you pray or not. God is not dependent on your prayers 
Before you ever pray, the Holy Spirit's working in their life. Before you ever pray, God's doing everything he can to win them to the kingdom. But God is limited. And that which limits God is their freedom of choice. Because God never violates our freedom of choice. God respects human freedom. When you pray, God looks at the devil and says, although I've done everything I could for John and Mary, I've respected their freedom of choice. But I also expect, respect Mark Finley's freedom of choice in praying for them. So he becomes a conduit of life unto life, and the life of the living God and the grace of God is poured out through you to touch that person in ways that I cannot fathom or understand or my reason or intellect cannot comprehend. Look at 1 John chapter 5, an amazing passage in Scripture. 1 John 5, verse 16. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin, which does not lead to death. Now, what's the sin that leads to death? What is that? That's the unpardonable sin. So here's a person that hasn't committed the unpardonable sin. He will ask. Now, who is the he that is doing the asking? Who's that? That's the intercessor, right? That's the intercessor. He will ask. And he, who's the second he? Who's the second he? God will give him, who's the him? The intercessor, life for those who commit sin not leading to death. Now, this is wonderful. This is wonderful. The intercessor shall ask, and he, God, will give the intercessor life for those that sin not unto death. Often I've been on my knees and I've said, Lord, may the life of God that flows from the sanctuary, the river of water of life, flow out through me to touch this man and this woman. Blessed is that godly Christian physician that gathers round his nurses and on their knees together with his, uh, f- with his physician's assistant prays for their patients. Seventh-day Adventist physicians using rational science and natural remedies should have far greater results than the world. Because we have a modality that the world does not know. Opening our hearts and minds through prayer. Here's a marvelous statement. When I got a hold of this one, I was more encouraged to pray than I ever was before in ministry of intercession. It's found there in Second Selected Messages, page 377. Ministering angels are waiting about the throne to instantly obey the mandate of Jesus Christ to answer every prayer offered in living faith. Ministering angels are waiting around the throne to instantly obey the mandate of Christ. You're on your knees praying for a patient, and your prayers ascend to the sanctuary where Jesus is. With his stripes, we are healed. And and the angel says, Lord, can I go? Can I wing my way from worlds afar in a ministry of healing? You say, God doesn't heal everybody. I'm a theologian, I know that. But I know this, he heals a lot more people when we pray than if we don't pray. The miracles of divine grace that we fail to see is, are possibly because we don't take the medicine that God has given. Prayer is a therapy combined with rational science and the most advanced scientific methods and natural remedies. Seventh-day Adventist godly physicians and dentists who move the arm of God with prayer will see miracles in their practices. And they will be representation of the character of God and the healing ministry of Christ, and men and women will be made whole. How do men and women pass from illness to wellness? How do they pass from sickness to health? There are a quartet in the spiritual inventory. The first in the area of this quartet is prayer. The second is the A in pass. It relates to the healing effects of our inner attitudes. Now, self-talk is either health-promoting or health-destroying. There is a little man that sits on every one of our shoulders. And for some people, that little man says that you're worthless. For some people, that little man says that you're not going to make much of your life. 
Every one of us talk to ourselves or is there some kind of voice in our head. And that voice is either health building or it is health destroying. Proverbs 17, 22 says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. And we know that that statement is physiologically true. I am not sure whether the author of Proverbs, Solomon, understood the physiology of bones. But we know today that bones are not dense masses. But there is blood that travels through those bones. And we also know that a broken, depressed, discouraged spirit does literally dry the bones. Scientifically, we know that it inhibits the fluid movement through the bones. There has been some amazing studies with arthritic patients that when you take arthritic patients and you give them quiet music to listen to and there is a mental change in the attitude and a much less stressful attitude but a much more peaceful attitude that there's a reduction in pain. A merry heart does do good like a medicine. A broken spirit does literally dry the bones. I was interested in two fascinating statements by Ellen White. The first is found in Ministry of Healing, page 241. Grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust, all tend to break down the life forces and invite decay and death. I began to look at each of those words. What is grief? What is anxiety? What is discontent? What's remorse? What's guilt? What's distrust? Grief unresolved sadness. Grief is sadness that you have not resolved. It's a lingering sadness in your life. It tends to break down the life forces. What is anxiety? Anxiety is a perpetual state of stress. Now, is stress good or is stress bad? Yes. (laughs) If I'm hiking in the sequoia forest. And I hear footprints behind me, and it's not my wife. The footprints are heavy. And I look over my shoulder, and I see a bear. My heart begins to beat faster. It pumps more blood through larger arteries. My respiration increases. My eyes are much wider. My vision is clearer to see the branches. My muscles are poised, tense like spring steel, and I run. If I'm running from a bear, is stress good or bad? But if I'm running for a bear from the time I get up in the morning to the time I go to bed at night... (laughs) If all day I run through life with my heart beating faster like some bear is chasing me, that's not stress any longer, that's anxiety. See, anxiety is a perpetual state of stress. That's the difference between stress and anxiety. See, anxiety is is this perpetual state. Your heart's always beating fast. Your muscles are always tense. Grief, unresolved sadness. Anxiety, a perpetual state of stress. Remorse. What's remorse? Remorse is a sense of prolonged discouragement over my failures in the past. It's one thing to feel that you failed in the past and deal with it. It's another thing to be remorseful. Remorse is this continual shadow that hangs over your life because of ways you failed in the past. Guilt. Now, there is a difference between guilt and guiltiness. Guilt occurs when we've broken the law of God and violated our moral conscience. Guiltiness is a state of perpetual guilt where the little voice in our head constantly condemns us. Ellen White says that grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust. What is distrust? Distrust is the lack of ability to have faith in anybody around me because they're going to let me down or in God above me because he's unworthy 
of my confidence. Distrust is living life on my own because nobody else can do it as good as me and nobody else can be trusted. Distrust is the self-centered life that lives in the island of their own thoughts. Distrust. Now notice, grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust all tend to break down the life forces and invite decay and death. That's why Ellen White says that nine-tenths of all of the diseases have their origin in the mind. Now look at the opposite side of that. Minister of Healing 241, Ellen White goes on. Courage, hope, faith, sympathy, and love promote health and prolong life. So on the one hand, you have guilt and anxiety and remorse and distrust that are breaking down the immune system. On the other hand, you have courage and hope and faith and sympathy and love that are building health and life. And I will suggest to you that you can use all the natural remedies in the world. But if in the mind of that person they are filled with grief, anxiety, discontent, now we hope that the natural remedies like walking and water treatments and massage and all that and good diet, we hope that it will put them in a state of mind so they can think positive thoughts. But unless we deal with the root of the problem, the external physical modalities are going to still leave those person filled with grief, anxiety, discontent, and remorse. Corrie Tim Boone, after she left Ravensbrook prison camp, opened up a home for people who were coming out of those prison camps. And she said those who were able to leave their past behind, those who were able to forgive, those who were able to to have a different mental outlook, were able to get on with life fairly well. Those that weren't, those who were filled with grief, remorse, and anxiety, they were left in a place of brokenness for all of their lives. In the taking of your spiritual inventory, how can you probe inner attitudes and move people from grief, remorse, anxiety, guilt to the positive, hopeful mental outlook in Christ? I have outlined a series of questions and then a strategy that I'd like to suggest to you. As you're talking to your patient about X, whatever the problem is, one of the questions you might want to ask is this. When did these symptoms begin? When did these symptoms begin? You're talking about this racing of your heart. When, when did that begin? You've come with this rash on your, your arms. What, when, when did that begin? Tell me a little bit about that. When was the first time you noticed it? You're talking about this unusual pain in your back. You're talking about this, this, this stomach disorder. Tell me a little about when, when did this begin? When you think about the beginning of this symptom, was there anything at that time unusual that happened in your life? Can you think of anything unusual that might have happened in your life at that time? Well, you know, Pastor, Doctor, I called you right, correct? Pastor or Doctor. You know, at that particular period of time, I was going through a divorce. Here is a green light that goes on in your mind. Here is something that begins to flash in your mind. When your symptoms began, can you think of anything specific that happened in your, in your life at that time? Was there anything unusual happened? You know, Pastor, Doctor, I uh, changed bosses, and I was a secretary for the same person for 15 years, but I changed, and within two or three weeks, I noticed this rash breaking out. Um, you know, Doctor, you asked me, did anything begin? Not much, but, but I did lose my job about that time, and, and you know... I do have about $18,000 in credit card debt. First question, when did these symptoms begin? Second question, did you notice anything in your life unusual that happened at that time? Third question, as you look back over your life, is there something that happened to you that's quite upsetting? Is there somebody that did something to you that's quite upsetting? You begin to draw the person out. 
as you begin to talk to them, you say to them, are you at a place in your life would you, where you would like to consciously let go of what happened in the past as therapy? I'd like to recommend a book to you that has been very helpful to me. In fact, there are two. One is called Putting Away Childish Things by Dr. David Siemens. He's a professor at Ashbury Theological Seminary in Kentucky, Putting Away Childish Things. He provides a spiritual approach to grief and anxiety that is solidly biblical. The other book that he wrote that is very helpful is Healing Damaged Emotions. He deals with a biblical approach to repairing the past and shifting the mind of the patient from the gloom and remorse of the past to the potential that there is in Christ. There is for those patients who have some Christian background and orientation an opportunity in the office to take a first and significant step toward healing. Let me suggest it to you. As you're talking to the patient, you, if you detect that they have some spiritual longings, you might want to say something like this to them. You've been talking to them about the source of strength. You've been talking to them about the damaging effect of grief and anxiety and guilt. You want them to pass from illness to wellness. And you're talking to them about their mental attitude. Here's a possibility. You might want to say to them, would you like to release, and you use your hands, would you like to release all this grief and anxiety and pain? I sense as I talk to you that there's a lot of emotional distress from your past. And I sense you've been hurt and you've been bruised. And it's just like you're a person with your teeth clenched holding it in your hand and you can't release it. You know, as a Christian, may I share with you something that's very helpful to me? That's a wonderful question, as a Christian. May I share with you something that's wonderful to me? Jesus said, come unto me, all you that are burdened and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. May I share with you something that may be helpful to you? I'd like you to take your fists and I'd like you to clench them. And I'd like you to imagine that in your hands you are holding grief and anxiety and guilt and remorse. Would you like to open your hands? When you walk out of the office today, you can walk out with clenched fists holding on to those things. If that is your choice, I'll prescribe for you the best that science has to offer, and I hope it helps. But as your physician, I want you to know that scientific evidence indicates that unless there is a change here, everything I can do for you physically is going to be limited. Would you like to open your hands? Why is it that God gave us communion? Why is it that God gave us baptism? Because the physical act reinforces the mental thought patterns. If you look at books in psychology 50 years ago, here's what you're going to read. Thoughts lead to actions. Today we know that that is not completely true. It is not true exclusively that thoughts lead to actions. We know today that the chart should not be linear, it should be circular. That thoughts lead to actions, but actions reinforce and lead to thoughts. So if you want to get a person to think a certain way, they have to begin acting that way. And the more you act away, the more you're going to think that way, and the more you think that way, the more you're going to act that way. This is an amazing psychological concept that God gave to Solomon in Proverbs. If you can get your patients acting in a certain way, that will influence their thought process.
process is so that they will think in a certain way. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 3 says, Commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. Now that's powerful. Commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. So at times we need to help our patients physically do something that will change the currents of their thoughts. So as a Christian physician, you've seen a person who's filled with grief and remorse and guilt and anxiety. I'm not suggesting you do this with every patient, but I'm suggesting that you allow the spirit to impress you with which patients to do it with. God will, God will open up your mind. God will impress you. And as you're sitting there, here is a spiritual modality. Try it and watch what happens. Say to your patient, I sense that you're filled with guilt and remorse and anxiety. We've talked about that. You've said that you're so stressed in the morning. You, you, you've said that, you, that you've got these condemning voices in your head. I'd like you to clench your fists. And Jesus says, come unto me, all you that are burdened and heavy laden. Would you like to open your hand and say, Jesus, I'm opening my hand and I'm releasing this guilt and anxiety. I'd like you to take a deep breath. I'd like you to open your hand. And in your mind, say, Lord, I'm releasing it. That simple act can make a powerful difference in passing from illness to wellness. I am not suggesting to you that that simple act solves the whole problem. The changing of the thought patterns often takes significant time. But what I am saying to you is that that is a journey on a first step to life and health. Jesus said, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. Do you remember that amazing story of the African walking down the trail with cassava on his head on the way to market? And one of his friends drove by in a wagon and he said, friend, get on the wagon. His friend gets on the wagon, jumps in the back. And they're riding along and the guy still has the cassava and he's holding it and it's crushing him down. And the driver of the wagon turns around and says, look, we're going to market. Put down your bag of cassava and jump up here in the front with me. And enjoy the ride. And his friend says, look, friend, you're giving me a ride. The least I can do is carry my own load. There are many Christians that through life that are carrying their own load. They're carrying guilt and fear and anxiety and remorse. And Jesus says, when you come to me, open your hands and put it down. I am your hope, your faith, your peace, your security. Passing from illness to wellness, prayer is a therapy. Redirected, rechanneled, refocused attitudes are a therapy. Thirdly, scripture applied is a therapy. Scripture applied is a therapy. Recently, I had an amazing experience. I will not tell you the country it occurred in, but I will tell you the level of the government office that it occurred in. I flew into the capital city of this country. When I arrived there, the hosts in that country said to me, Pastor Mark, we have arranged to take you right now to Parliament. You will go to Parliament and meet with the President of the Parliament. Now, I had met with heads of state. Shortly before this, I had been with Dr. Jan Paulson when we met with Paul Gagami, the president of Rwanda. So I've been on many protocol visits. I understand what happens in a protocol visit. In a protocol visit, generally, we come in. We talk about the mission of the Adventist Church worldwide. We talk about our educational institutions, our medical institutions. It's an extremely formal time. You stand with the head of state, your picture is taken. You talk to the head of state about the Adventist Church in that country. You are very conversant. You do your homework ahead of time. We are supplied with briefs as we walk in. So I understand protocol visits. So I was going to a protocol visit went into the capital of that country, was ushered into Parliament. The armed forces were on either side as I walked through. Came into a chamber of Parliament. The vice president of the, par the president of the Parliament sat there with a young 33-year-old congressman. We went through the protocol visit. There were, oh, and in these protocol visits, there are 12 to 15 people. There are delegations and staff from the po political parties as well as delegations and staff from the Adventist Church, local presidents of unions and conferences and so forth, and we talked. We talked. Wonderful visit. Protocol visit went on script. And 
exactly like the script read. And I sensed that God led, and I got up to leave and uh, greeted the president of the uh, Congress and was walking out. And the 33-year-old congressman was about five paces in front of me. He took out his cell phone and he made a call. came back to me and said, Pastor Mark, I just called the White House of our country, the capital of the country, and uh, we were in the parliament. The president of our country is in China. He is negotiating a new political deal with China. The vice president of our country is the president um, for this time. He's running the country. We're going through a major crisis in the country. And the major crisis is our nurses are on strike. Our hospitals are not functioning. Our farmers are on strike. The vice president has been negotiating for the last two weeks. He's whipped, he's beat, he's tired. I just called him on the cell phone. And he said that he will see you right now if you can come. Now, these protocol visits normally take six months to arrange. But I sense God was arranging this. I get in the chauffeured limousine with its armor driven with the congressman. And in the limousine, I looked at the congressman and I said, now tell me everything you can about the vice president. I learned that this congressman, 33 years old, had a mother who was a Seventh-day Adventist. That's why he made that telephone call, his heritage. He was the, he's the youngest congressman in that country. He's in charge of, uh, he's working on the budget of the nation, multi-billion dollar budget. So as we, we traveled to the vice president, he said, the vice president's name is, and he told me, and he said, he's an Orthodox Jew. And I don't know what his faith is, or I don't know whether he believes in God or not. We came to the White House there, and I was ushered in. And I decided when I came in that I was going to sweep all protocol aside. Now, there is one thing you never do with a head of state. You never touch him. You never touch a head of state. The vice president walked in. He was haggard. He had a scruffy beard. It was obvious to me that he had been up for two or three nights. He uh, had no tie on. His shirt was rumpled. And he came and sat next to me. I reached over and took his hand. My host about faint. You do not do that. But I decided I was going to sweep away all protocol. I reached over and took his hand and I said, Mr. Vice President, in addition to being the Vice President of the nation, you are a human being. And I've been watching the news and reading the paper, and I sense the last few days have been rough. And I've come by today in your busy schedule not to take up your time with a protocol visit. But I've come to tell you the story of an ancient Jewish king that went through an incredible crisis and about a prophet that gave him some hope. Do you have a little time for me to talk to you about that ancient Jewish king? He looked at me and he said, Pastor, I sure do. I told him about the year that King Uzziah died and the crisis that there was in Israel and how the prophet Isaiah pointed the mind of the new ruler from the things that were going on around him in crisis to the things that were going on above him. And we talked. And I quoted Isaiah 26, verse 3, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. We talked about the peace that comes from the eternal. And I quoted Bible passage after Bible passage, Fear not, for I'll be with you. When you walk through the waters, I'll be with you. We talked about that God created us, God redeemed us. We talked about the fact that we are his. We talked about the fact that there is peace in the eternal. And then I said to him, Mr. Vice President, could I pray for you? And we prayed together. I got up to leave, and he said to the congressman, you stay here. I left. Vice President and the congressman were together. I stood in the hall a little nervous. My heart was palpitating. I wondered, did I do the wrong thing? I actually put my hand on his shoulder when we prayed. The congressman came out beaming. He said, you are never going to believe what just happened. I said, what was it? He said, the Bible text that you read, that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. He said, the vice president just told me that this was the most important meeting he had this week. He's been negotiating. He's been in front of the television cameras. He was at the end of his rope about ready to crack. And he said to me that this visit was an oasis in the middle of a political storm. And he couldn't stop thanking me that you came and opened God's word. Scripture is a therapy. 
Now take your Bible, please, and turn to Revelation chapter 22. Well, first, Ezekiel chapter 47. Ezekiel chapter 47. Here is something amazing, something incredible. Ezekiel chapter 47. Starting with the first verse, there is a river that comes from the sanctuary. It flows through the earth. First, it's up to the man's ankles, then up to the man's knees, then up to the man's waist, then it's over his head. This is the river of water of life that comes in healing love from the sanctuary above. This is medical missionary work. And we come to the end, Ezekiel 47, verse 12. Along the bank of the river, on this side and that, will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food. Their leaves will be for medicine. Now, what vision do you have when you read Ezekiel 47, verse 12? Where is there that tree that leaves do not wither? Where is that tree that its fruit does not fail? Where is that tree that bears its fruits every month and its leaves are for medicine? What tree is that? What tree is that? Where else do you read this? In what book of the Bible? What chapter of Revelation? What verse of 22? Take your Bible, please, and turn to Revelation chapter 22. All the books of the Bible meet and end in Revelation. There are 404 verses from the Old Testament that find their lodgment in Revelation. The reason we struggle in understanding Revelation is because we do not understand the significance of biblical symbolism in the rest of the Bible. We treat Revelation as some kind of a commentary on current events rather than an expose of the rest of Scripture. Revelation 22, verse 2. Verse 1, And he showed me a pure river of the water of life. This is the life of God that flows from the sanctuary that Ezekiel 47 is talking about, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, in our past verse, it said the leaves of the tree were medicine. Here it says they're for the healing of the nations. This is after the millennium. Why are the leaves of the tree for the healing of the nations after the millennium? Because the root word for healing here is a different word in its upbuilding or restoration. The leaves of the tree are for the restoration of the nation. The leaves of the tree are like medicine. Now, what are the leaves of the tree of life? Here you have it. Ministry of Healing, page 122. So with all the promises of God's word, in them he is speaking to us individually, speaking as directly as if we could listen to his voice. It is in these promises that Christ communicates to us his grace and power. They are leaves from the tree of life for the healing of the nations, received, assimilated. They are to, to be the strength of character, the inspiration and sustenance of life. Nothing else can have such healing power. Nothing besides can impart such courage and faith, which gives vital energy to the whole being. So the promises of the word of the living God are leaves from the tree of life. And the tree of life is so large that its vines hang over the wall of the holy city and they hang down tonight to where you are and to where I am. And we can pick the leaves of the tree of life and eat them and assimilate them into our being and they bring health and vitality to the whole being. Because Ellen White says that received, assimilated, they bring strength of character That spiritual inspiration that is mental, a new outlook on life as you read the word of God. And they are sustenance to life. Nothing else can give such healing power. Nothing else can give such healing power. You see, I can walk. But in all my walking, I can be talking to the person I'm walking with about gossip and criticism. I can eat whole wheat bread and granola. I can be a vegan vegetarian. But if I sit there and wolf my food down in a minute and a half because I'm so stressed that i got to go give another hydrotherapy treatment. You see. Scripture settles my troubled soul, relaxes my wearied body, and brings peace to my anxious mind. The leaves of the tree of life are to be harvested by godly Christian physicians and ground up in an herb bottle 
to be given to their patients at the right time. A text shared at the right time is life transforming. I was holding an evangelistic meeting in Springfield, Massachusetts. I saw him sitting in the back. I knew him well. His father was a pastor in the Adventist church, and I had held an evangelistic meeting with his dad before. But the pastor's wife could not come to the evangelistic meeting because the son would have LSD drug parties at the home. And the headlines came out in the newspaper, drug bust at Adventist pastor's home. I saw him sitting there, this young man, now in a distant city, living with a young woman that was not his wife. I saw him there in the meeting. I knew the family well. I had known them for 15 years, 20 years. At the end of the sermon, I saw him beginning to come down the aisle. And I saw her. She took him by the arm and began to pull him out the door. I knew what was happening. She was whispering in his ear. She said, don't go down and talk to that preacher. We came by the meeting tonight. I told you I'd come because you knew this guy, but I want you out. Let's go. They let go of one another's hands about halfway down the aisle, and he walked up with his long hair and deep, sunken, glossy eyes with his tobacco breath. I looked into that face, that Adventist preacher's son, and I knew I had about a minute and a half with him. We sat down, and he said, just wanted to say hi. I said, hi. He said, so I just want to come by and say hi. Put my hand on his shoulder, called him by name, and said to him, I know that the last few years have been rough, but I want to share something with you. I opened my Bible to the book of Joel, read him this passage. Though the locusts and vermin destroy the land, I will restore to you the years that the locust and the canker worm has eaten. And I said to him, can I read the text a different way? I'll restore to you the years that drugs have destroyed the brain, that alcohol has controlled the life. I will restore to you the years. And I said, how does God restore years? You can't go back and live them over again. You wish you could, I'm sure. Sometimes when you lie at bed at night, you say, how did I ever get in this situation? I wish I could live life over again. How does God restore the years? He gives you a better future than you do have had in the past. And the future is so much better and it's so much glorious that you forget the past because you live in the present with Christ. And Jesus has a promise to you, and I want you to cling to that promise. I want you to hold on to that promise, whatever happens in your life, that God will restore to you the years of everything you've lost. God will do that for you. He told me years later that that one promise he clung to, he left the meeting that night, all his problems were not solved, but he left determined to live a new life. He left that girl that he was living with. He moved from the East Coast out here to California and spent a year up here in the Sequoias reading Desire of Ages and, and bathing his mind. He came back to a little training school that I was conducting in Chicago called the Lake Union Soul Winning Institute. He had not graduated from high school. I urged him to get his GED, and he did. He then went on to Andrews University and got a Master's of Divinity degree, and years later I hired Mark Fox at It Is Written, and he became one of our most powerful evangelists. He told me, he said, Pastor Mark, one of the things that turned my life around was that one text that went over and over and over and over in my mind. I will restore to you the years. Prayer is a therapy. A change in mental attitude leading your patients to release grief and anxiety is a therapy. Scripture is a therapy. You can often say to a patient, may I, may I. You ask permission, may I, may I pray with you. May I share with you a Bible text that's meaningful to me. May I share with you a passage of Scripture that will be helpful. As a godly Christian physician whose mind is filled with thousands of Bible texts, the Spirit will bring you to that person's help at the very time they need. The last therapy that I want to share with you is found in Isaiah 58, verse 11. Isaiah 58 and verse 11. This is that great passage in Scripture on medical missionary work. Isaiah 58 and verse 11.
we will look earlier than verse 11. Isaiah chapter 58. And I'd like you to look there at Isaiah 58, and we'll continue to read. We'll start with verse 6. We'll start with verse 6. Is not this the fast that I've chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness. He continues. Is not this the fast I've chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo heavy burden, to let the oppressed go free. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, that you bring to your house the poor that are cast out? When you see the naked, that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh, then your light shall break forth like the morning and your healing shall spring forth speedily. When will your healing spring forth speedily? When you bring the poor to your house when you share your bread with the hungry, when you hide not yourself from your own flesh, that is when you do acts of unselfish love. What is the text saying? It's saying that your health springs forth speedily when you're actively involved in service for others. When you minister to somebody else, sometime, if you can direct a patient's attention from themselves, from their own needs, from their own sickness, from their own problems, if you can direct their attention to minister to somebody else, that is the very key that that promotes healing in their own life. Some of the people that have gone through the most traumatic experiences in their life and have redirected their remorse and their sorrow and their sadness into service have been healed. Let me give you an example. We often sing that song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. One of the things that I love to do is read him stories. Now, normally, I have a routine. Wherever I travel in the world, I have a routine. People say to me, Pastor Mark, how can you travel all over the world and maintain any measure of health? It's because I have a routine. I try to do the same thing systematically wherever I am. Every day, I have a principle in my life. I want to walk. We try to walk 40, 45 minutes a day wherever we are in the world. I can remember in the early, uh, in the late 80s, I would be in communist countries uh, often negotiating for the Seventh-day Adventist Church religious liberty issues and, and evangelistic issues. I can remember night after night walking with my hat over my head, walking the streets of Belgrade, the streets of, uh, uh, of Moscow, in the days of, of communism, walking those streets. So we try to walk everywhere we are. We try to be disciplined in our diet. Every place we go, and I try to get seven to eight hours of sleep. I don't believe in this five hours of sleep business. Uh, I regularly, I've got to sleep seven, seven and a half hours every single night and try to do that religiously. But every night religiously, my wife knows what's going to happen. Every night religiously, I take a bath or take a shower. A bath most of the time, right there? Take my bath. And I read in the bath. I don't read any heavy stuff in the bath. I love to read hymn stories. That's... Every book I can find on hymn stories, I read them. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Picked up a new book called Stories Behind the Hymns That Inspire America. Great book. What a friend we have in Jesus. Written by Joseph Scriven. Joseph Scriven was born in England. Scriven was engaged to be married. Two weeks before his marriage, his fiance drowned. Moved to Canada. Depressed, discouraged, all kind of physical symptoms thought I'll never get married, never find somebody as good. Met a wonderful Canadian lady. Two months before their marriage, she got pneumonia and died. Just absolutely crushed him, absolutely crushed him. All kind of physical symptoms. And he said, what am I going to do with my life? And he got an idea. He was a lumberman. And he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to work for no money. I'm going to work for the poor. And he took his axe and went out into the woods and began chopping wood. And he would give it to the poor. And he lived for the rest of his life, a healthy, productive life until his death, ministering to the poor. He had no money to go to his mother's funeral when she died. And she died in England. And so he wrote her a poem. Mother, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. 
because we do not carry everything to God in prayer, Joseph Scriven found renewed life and healing in service. How can your patience pass from death to life, from illness to wellness? Pray with them. Let them release their anxieties and positive attitudes. Lead them into the Scripture and lead them into service. And you will be a medical missionary physician. Amen.